like at the moment of your death, you get to meet God and you, you get to ask one question. What question would you like to ask? Or maybe a whole conversation. I don't know. It's up to you. It's more dramatic when it's just one question. Well, if it's only one question and I died, yeah. I would just want to know that Priscilla and my family, like if they were going to be okay, that might depend on the circumstances of my death. But I think that in most circumstances that I can think of, that's probably the main thing that I would care about. Yeah, I think God would hear that question and be like, all right, fine, you get in. That's that's the right that's the right question <laughs> to ask. Is it is it? I don't know. <laughs> the humility and selfishness. Well, it, it, all right. You're you're right. I mean but <laughs> well maybe they're gonna be fine, don't worry, you're okay. in. But I mean one of the things that I think you str I struggle with at least is on the one hand, that's probably the most the thing that's closest to me and maybe the most common human experience, but I don't know. One of the things that I, I just struggle with in terms of running this large enterprise is like, should the thing that I care more about be that responsibility? And I think it's shifted over time. I mean, it, like before I really had a family, that was like the only thing I cared about. And I, I, at this point, it's, I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I care deeply about it, but like, yeah, I think that that's that's not as obvious of a question. Yeah, we humans are weird. You get you get you get this ability to uh, impact millions of lives, and it's definitely something billions of lives. It's something you care about. But the the the, the weird humans that are closest to us, those are the ones that um, mean the most. And I suppose that's the dream of the metaverse: is to connect form small groups like that where you can have those intimate relationships let me ask you the big ridiculous well and to be able to be close not just based on who you happen to be next to i think that's what the internet is already doing is allowing you to spend more of your time not physically proximate i mean i i always think when you think about the the metaverse people ask this question about the real world it's like do you, the virtual world versus the real world and it's like no the, the real world is a combination of the virtual world and the physical world. But I think over time, as we get more technology, the physical world is becoming less of a percent of the real world. And I think that that opens up a lot of opportunities for people because, you know, you can, you can work in different places. You can you know, stay more close to, stay closer to people who are in different places. Yeah, I think that's good. Removing barriers of geography and then barriers of language. That's, yeah. That's, that's a beautiful vision in the annual perspective. Politics. Okay, so artillery. Yeah. So that's the hand of God. <laughs> Sorry. No, I... I, <laughs> I that's, that's intensely uh, romanticized version, but okay, artillery, the hand of God. So Because it will reach out and touch you from wherever we want. It's like, it's like F... Um, F-18 pilots or bombers, they'll, you won't know they're there until they're there. And so for artillery, I, I really honestly didn't think artillery would be a fit for me. I didn't know much about it. They were just like, these are what you can pick from. And I was like, I'll go here. So in World War II, they used much closer artillery. So it's the, we're called the Royal Canadian Horse Artillery because the queen made us royal. So mm -hmm. Canadian artillery. And um, we we shoot these rounds when you're in training. You shoot smaller smaller ammunition. They're about forty pounds. They go. I'm gonna get this wrong. Twenty k, twenty kilometers, so whatever that is in your mm. mile things. And um, they have a casing on them, and uh, they're much easier. They're easier to handle. The guns are smaller. You need less people for them. They're basically what you train on nowadays. It's not what we use overseas. What we use overseas. Now, those things are beautiful. Those are uh, just a sheer work of... Uh, the engineering behind them just makes my heart skip a beat. Yeah, the engineering on modern guns is amazing. So are we talking about machine guns here? So like no, you're talking fully about, automatic? No, you're talking about artillery guns. So what it is, it's a 155 millimeter howitzer that shoots up to, up to 40 kilometers accurately, 45 unrecorded, and it shoots a 100-pound round. Oh, okay. And so that, but the, there is still precision. Accurate as hell. Uh, accurate, okay. 
accurate if the people behind it that are shooting it and aiming it are accurate. Okay. Uh, so, so how, at which stage of the warfare do they come in? Are they saving you? Like, no. say a bunch of people get uh, raided, a bunch of the soul infantry get raided, and then the artillery saves them, or are they the first line of attack, or what? Where are they? Where, where does the art artillery come? Like the hand of God presumes because it reaches they're helping. Their, yeah, yeah. That's well. That's it. So, depending on the operation or whomever is running it or how they want it done, sometimes if they just know there's targets, they'll use us you know, high value targets. So we have this round, it's called the Excalibur round. It costs about half a million dollars per round. It comes in a special tube that is like sealed and locked and you have to get permission from Ottawa to shoot it. And it's only used for VIP targets. So like we have VIP for everyone and it will, it's GPS guided, it's rocket propelled. And when you fire it, it will, if, if this is a wall and somebody standing on this side of it will hit you right there. We won't touch that wall. It will hit you pinpoint. It'll go right through whatever concrete, whatever, and then it will destroy. So it's basically uh, the same thing as being a sniper, but with a much more damaging weapon. We don't use that round often. I think it's only been used a handful of times max in Afghanistan that I'm aware of. Again, I haven't, I wasn't there from 2009 until 21. But I, I know people that still deployed in that in those units, and I don't know that it was used very often. But the regular rounds, so there's HE, there's Loom. So HE is high explosive. There's Loom. You shoot that, it explodes in the sky. It lights up the sky for the infantry below. Wow. Um, and then there's shrapnel rounds that will explode in the sky, and then shrapnel just rains down hell on you. HE is what you use normally in my, I'm trying to say this right because I, I know people squawked at me about some of the stuff on Jocko, so I'm trying to be very accurate. In my experience, we used HE rounds to wipe people off the face of the earth when the infantry needed us. So we would get a call at any time, and there's always two guns together. So you never you never go solo gun, ever. If you are, it's there's it's sketchy and there's a, the, bad shit's happening. Can you explain that? So there's two, gun, two people, two guns? Nope. Two guns with each gun troop. So each gun troop has five to seven people running a gun at all times. Oh, wow. Okay. It takes a lot of people to run one of those. How accurate. much electronics is there? The GPS, like the computer system that's on it itself. I never ran that much, but it is completely technologically. It's GPS guided. All you have to do is literally type in the coordinates. Then you've got the two big, um, there's a, there's a technical word, word for it, but basically wheels. <laughs> and one does the trajectory, you know, you do your, right, right. and you're yes. just kind of doing this and you're watching the watching it. And once you hit your target, that's, you know, it'll tell you that's where you need to hit. Do you know if there's any like AI stuff like computer vision, like uh, where there's cameras and they help you target using like all different kinds of cameras to see through like the fog, all those kinds of things. No, we so, use um, the FOO, which are forward observation officers, which are an artillery individual that is, embedded with an infantry unit. Oh, wow, okay. They call from the front, give us their grid coordinates, and basically okay. say like, don't drop this on us. Got it. So, well, you know what not to sh which parts not to shoot. Correct. And then- the As long as no one moves. <laughs> don't move, stay still. <laughs> but you can hear it coming. Yeah. But you can't hear it until it's too close. So like when I went, sorry, go ahead. You were gonna say something. No, what's, I was gonna say, what's the experience on the other, like, what does it feel like to be maybe infantry or- Underneath it? Underneath the artillery. Well, I I had the rare opportunity to do that. And I have a video I'll show you after. It's terrifying. Because <laughs> I know the people that were shooting it. And I know them personally. And I know what they're like as humans. And for the most part, they're dialed. Well, you get the odd duck where you're like, I've seen people have an ND, which is a negligent discharge. You basically get charged for it. You get in a lot of trouble because you can blow people up. And I, it like accidents happen. And so I know accidents can happen in stressful situations. And when I was with the Brits, we had to call danger close artillery. And when it goes over top of you, it sounds like thunder and lightning. So you fire it. And it's not the stereotype that you hear in World War II where it kind of like that. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. more of like a crackle. Mm -hmm. And then you just hear like a whiz and it sh shit just goes everywhere. It's loud. It shakes the ground. It shakes you. It You feel it. Okay. Is there some more words you can put to like the experience of what it's like to be in, in the heat of, 
of of battle there. So what is I is there literally is it hot? Is it Are you uh, talking about being under it or shooting un, it? Under it. Oh yeah, it 55 degree heat. You're you know that you're waiting for it to be called. You feel an overwhelming excitement to start because for me I'd never been under it. So I was like, okay, I had my camera ready like I was a kid at a candy store and I'm like I want to watch this happen. And once you hear the crackle, I got really fearful. My anxiety kicked up significantly. I I got to the point where I got numb. Like I was, my nerves were on overdrive so much that like my body would go like numb. Like I could move, but like my nerves were numb, if that makes sense. What what were the nerves like? We're we talking about fear or is it just no. an, an, an anxious excitement? Anxious excitement, hopeful that they wouldn't blow it up on us. And okay. there was this, there was this excitement that's hard to describe because you don't want to be excited that you're dropping bombs on people. But when you just saw their faces and they're shooting at you, there's this overwhelming feeling of, got you, motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that because that's such a difficult thing about war is you forget that it's other human beings. Yeah, you Because do. those other human beings are doing really bad things to you. And so the very basic anger takes over, um, hate can take over, mm -hmm. and then also just the excitement of almost like video game, like, you know, aspect of war, like sport. It's it's like sport that all of those elements are all baked in. And it's, it's hard to be philosophical in that situation, it seems like. I've never played video games, so I can't compare it to that. But like from from like a sports perspective, yeah, I could I could argue that like I felt like we won there for a second. And it, it's not just like a heat from outside. It's like this radiation within you that is something I've never felt since. You, uh, just to take a small step back to the weapons mm -hmm. training, what uh, what kind of guns did you train on? Because you also mentioned a rocket launcher. I love Carl Gustafs. God. What are those? What are, what are those Carl G? Carl G's? What what's that? What's uh what's, what's a it like? My only experience with the rocket launches is from the movie Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh yeah, and we've all discussed that. I haven't seen that yet, and I've heard about it, and people have made me tell. Yeah, I know. I feel like you haven't seen a single movie that's relevant to war military because every time anyone brings it up, you say you haven't seen it. I don't have it's time great. to watch movies, Lex. Platoon. You haven't seen Platoon, which is um. You're the scientist. How do you have the time? I'm not a scientist. I just play one on TV. Oh. <laughs> okay. Sure. In this two-way communication, uh, is there a way you, that you could try to describe on a podcast that what is God? <laughs> what is God like? Uh, in your view, uh, uh, if if you try to describe, is it a force? Um, is it a, a set, is it uh for you in intellectually? Is it a set of metaphors? that you use to reason about the world? Is it, um, is, it, uh, is, it is it kind of a computer that does some computation, that's the infinitely powerful computer? Uh, or is it uh, like Santa Claus, a guy with a, with a beard on the cloud? Like, uh, I don't mean, um, I don't mean what God actually is. I mean, in your limited uh, cognitive capacity as a human, <laughs> what do you actually, uh, what do you find helpful for thinking of what God actually looks like. What is God? Well, let me start by saying none of the above, okay? <laughs> I mean, clearly God, in, in the Christian God, um, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, et cetera, um, it, it is, is not any of those things because all of those things you just mentioned are phenomena or, or, or entities in the created world. Right. And the most fundamental thing about monotheism as you know Abraham and Moses and so forth handed it down is that God is not an entity within the, the creation within the universe that God is the creator of it all and that's what Genesis first two chapters of Genesis is really about is it's not it's not about telling us you know how God created the world it's about telling us and telling the early Hebrews that God created the world. Okay, and that therefore he is not, you know, simply an entity within it. On the other hand, you know, our finite minds have a pretty hard time encompassing that right. 
Yeah. So, so one has to therefore work in terms of metaphors and images and and so forth. And um, I think we would know very little about who God is um, if we, if it was simply up, if we were simply left to our own devices. You know, if it, if we were just you know here you are you're in the universe try to figure out who who made it and. Uh, and so forth. Well, you know, philosophers think they can do a little bit of that, maybe, uh, and theologians think that they can do a little bit more. But um, but Christians think uh, that God has actually helped us along a lot by revealing himself. And, and we say that he's revealed himself supremely in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and so, you know, when Jesus says to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, um, then that is, in a certain sense, a watchword for answering this question for Christians. It, it is that, supremely, if we want to help ourselves understand who God really is, we look to Jesus. We look to what he did. We look to what he said, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, and uh, we believe that he is one with the Father, and that's why we believe, you know, in the Trinity. I mean, it's basically because um, that revelation is extremely um, central to Christian belief and teaching. So, in that in that sense, th through Jesus, there was um, that's kind of a historical moment that's profound, that's really powerful. But do you also think that God makes Himself seen in less obvious ways in our world today? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's certainly been the outlook of um, Jews and Christians throughout uh, history that God is seen in the creation. That we, when we look at the creation, we see to some extent the wonder, the majesty, the might of the person or the entity, but the person who created it. And uh, and that's a way in which scientists, particularly, uh, have over over the ages, and certainly over most of the last five centuries since the scientific revolution, scientists have seen, in a certain sense, the hand of God in creation. I mean, uh, this leads us perhaps to a different discussion, but I mean, it's it's remarkable to me how influential. Um, Christianity and religion in generally has been in science. Yeah, well, most of the scientists through history, as if, uh, if you described, I mean, God has been a very big part of their life and their yeah, work. Yeah, certainly up until the, tw at the beginning of the 20th century, that was the case. So maybe this is a good time to, for somebody who's looking at the young universe, at the early universe, and are talking about God and are agnostic, who do you think is God? Hmm. So I thought you had just like one of the best podcasts with Sam Harris this past summer. And um, one of the things I liked about that conversation is he talked a lot about happiness and meditation. And he said something that's really resonated with me and I've been working it around and trying to work on it my own way. But he said like, you can never... You can never be happy. You can only become happy. And I've tried to take it a little bit further than that because I think it's it's interesting. Like meditation is like you're not like oh I, I'm happy and now like oh my kid came in and now I'm not happy. Like no, like you can be satisfied. Kurt Vonnegut said like some, you ever catch this? Sometimes Lex, you're like walking around, and you're like life is freaking amazing. Mm -hmm. Like I'm happy. And L Kurt Vonnegut said you should say to yourself every time that happens, like a little mantra, like, if this isn't goodness, if this isn't happiness, nothing is. Mm -hmm. Just remind yourself how mm -hmm. awesome it is, every breath, everything that you do, when you make an impact, even some of the bad stuff that happens, good, it's mm -hmm. good. So Sam said that, and it made me think, because I was like, well, what does it really mean to to be happy? Uh, because like, I can think of, um, I can think of about, you know, two or three ways that right now I could double my happiness. You know, like win the lottery or whatever, like I double my happy. There's only a few ways though, right? Like 
you know, I had uh, um, this this kind of thought, like, how many boats can you water ski behind? <laughs> like, you had twice as many followers. Now you've got 2 million followers, 5 million, whatever. It doesn't do anything. It's called the hedonic treadmill. Like, once you get to a certain level, it takes a lot more, you know, change in followers, money, impact, women, whatever you want to make you have one more quanta of happiness, right? On the other hand, this is a concept from entropy. I could make your life miserable in an infinite number of ways. In other words, there's more space space to make your life unhappy than happy. And so I thought about that in the context of what Sam said about happiness. Um, so it, it's sort of like, yeah, it's an expression of entropy. And that what you should be doing in life is doing that which will cause you devastation if it goes away. Because those are the things that like are where you're reducing entropy, like a kid, like anyone who's a parent knows instantly what I'm talking about, like how to make your life a billion times worse. But there's no way to make your life a billion times better. And so thinking about that, now turning it to the question of God's existence, I feel like there's no way that you can believe in God, to quote, misquote Sam, but there's ways that you can be become a believer in God. In other words, you could increase the Bayesian confidence level that there is some, and let's not call it God because that's a freighted term. Let's just call it some infinite source of goodness or our beautiful power in the universe, right? Mm. Simple things can do that. You can increase your credulity in the goodness of life. And we have this bias as humans towards negativity, negativity bias, well-known fact. So what I want to do is, is it, let's call God good, right? That's where it comes from. God, good. Same words in German. And when we think about what is good, let's do those things that would devastate us. And a lot of that could be relationships. And there's a powerful concept from, um, from network theory, which is that, you know, the number of connections in a network you know, I'm just saying it for you. It grows as the square of the elements in the matrix and the number, right? So you think of a matrix with N people, you know, person one, two, three, four, and then there's four other people. There's 16 different pairs, but two, half of them overlap. The diagonal is where you know each other, you know yourself. <laughs> so there's, but that still grows as N squared. So those connections increase and decrease, right? Like you ever have two friends that are fighting? And like, you're kind of upset, even though you're not fighting with either one of them. So like a network grows like that. So you want to increase your network as much as possible, but only the kind of high quality interstices between them. And I think in doing so, you in, you you make yourself fragile, not anti-fragile. And I think that is where purpose and maybe approaching some notion of God can come from. So that is a source of meaning, maximizing the goodness in life and the way you know is good is if it's taken away, it would devastate you. That's one way. Think about it, your brand, your business, your spouse, your kids. I mean, parents can't count them. I've, I've known parents that have lost. Jim Simons, here's a perfect example. He's one of my oldest friends and mentors. He is one of the richest people on earth. Gulfstream, mega yacht. <laughs> this is all documented, books about him. Um, he lost two sons as adults. And I hear people say, oh, I'm so jealous of Jim Simons. Would you take everything? I don't know where he has that strength and his wife, Marilyn, and his first wife, Barbara. I'm not, I'm not like that. Uh, some people are, there are angels that walk among us. And, you know, I, there's this famous prayer. It's like, you know, uh, God, you know, there's, there's an old saying that like one of the hardest tests there are in life is to be given a lot of money. And you see it like happens with like lawyer, like people that win the lottery or whatever, or NFL football players after their career's over, they get, they're broke, right? And I always go like, God, please test me with money. You know, that'd be great. But, but in reality, you should never say I'm gonna, I want what X person has, unless you're willing to take everything and you'll find you won't want to take everything. Who's God to you? I'm glad you just asked that question because I actually, mm, I'm going to have to make a, a distinguishable separation here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and it's funny because I heard recently, uh, I heard a rabbi was debating with uh, this historian, Dr. Ben. I can't pronounce Dr. Ben's name, but there was debating. And in the debate, they started going back through the etymology they went way back beyond antiquity because they was debating. And so there was, you know, some things, they was going deep. 
And they really went far, far back to kind of the first word of, of God. Mm-hmm. And it was, when they pronounced it on this particular debate, it was Allah. And they said from that, they got Elohim. Mm-hmm. Um, I've already agreed in my heart and my life that the father of this universe, proper name is Allah. Um, and of course, in Allah, I get all, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, and I don't think that God is the same is that I think a law gives birth to God. In fact, if you take the word Allah, A-L-L-A-H, and you take it through numerology or numbers, the number A being, letter A being one, L being 12, and you add it all up to its lowest, uh, to the, you know, the, the last denominator, you're going to get the number seven. And the number seven is going to bring you right back to that letter G. So a law borns God, but God don't born a law. How does how does that God, how does a law connect to the oracle the that you're you're going to be calling for when you're laying in the hospital? Well, what I was saying in that particular verse was that we're looking for the oracle. We're looking for somebody else or something to help us that nobody can really help you at the end of the day. You know, and we're speaking on on so now that we, I don't want to say we're speaking on religion, but we're speaking on a way of life and a way of thinking. Uh, and I've read many books, of course. And I could say there's no book that my, the book that is the most strongest book I've ever read is actually the Holy Quran. Hmm. It's stronger to me than, my, than the Bible, which I've read. It's stronger than quantum physics, which I've read. It's stronger than the Bhagavad Gita. It's just... And and I read once uh, a British scholar said it's the most stupidest book ever written, and it doesn't make sense. And I, so I said, oh, I, I see why he says that. Though. I can understand exactly why he said that as mm-hmm. well. Why is that? Because the the structure of the words are just it's peculiar. You know what I mean? But it's almost like how some people's songs you don't really know exactly what they say until years later yeah <laughs> uh yeah you have uh actually with joe rogan i think you talked about how uh, a joke of dave Chappelle's hit you like <laughs> a long time after yeah. this so this is kind of like the quran it, it uh I, I tend to believe that we, we uh, human beings cannot possibly understand anything as big as the, these ideas so um just i don't know do, do you think that like, are you humble in the face of just the the immensity of it? To be honest, yes. I'm humble in the face of the, and you can say the word again, I pronounce words funny, the, om, the omnipotence, <laughs> the omniscience, the yeah. magnitude. Yeah. I'm humble in the face of in the face of Allah. The problem that we I may have had was that I wasn't humble in the face of God because it's just a definable thing. And that's why I think a lot of us, and I'm saying that, you know, I know when we say God, we're trying to say Allah, <laughs> like people was saying that, but you're actually not saying the same thing because you're actually putting something beside him. And, and that's the reason why you can have all, as many gods. You can find a whole bunch of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you're not going to find many. There's nobody beside Allah. I mean, law is one. So I know it's a whole thing, but that's my heart is is there. I'm humbled by it. I'm at peace with it. Uh, And it doesn't take nothing or demerit anything from myself. That's the beauty of it. It doesn't take nothing from me, from being who. So if I say, if if somebody woke up, yo, peace, God, I could take that because they're telling me that, yo, I'm a man of wisdom. I'm a man of strength. I'm a man of beauty or some attribute of that, you know what I mean? So Wu-Tang, they the gods of rap. There's wisdom there, there's strength there, there's beauty that we'll take that. <laughs> yeah. So You said Nietzsche, one of your favorite philosophers, he said uh, famously, one of the many famous things he said is that God is dead. Yes. Uh, what do you think he meant? Do you think he was right? Okay, good. I love this question. No one asks me about Nietzsche. (laughs) And I love Nietzsche. Okay, so um, first, actually, I do think, and I could be corrected and probably will be in all the comments, 
Well, first, Nietzsche, it's true, wasn't the first to say God is dead. I think Hegel said it, okay? No one reads Hegel. He's like so difficult to read that it's impossible. Same with Heidegger, as you mentioned. He, yeah, I I love him, but yeah, he's really hard to read. Um, So Nietzsche's basically said God is dead. And let me give you the context for him saying that. He also said this. He said there was only one Christian. He died on the cross, Mm. okay? So um, he despised Christianity. And he said that- And and the people who practice it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But again, he believed in Jesus and he believed Jesus was, no, he didn't believe he was a divinity, he believed Jesus was a good man mm-hmm. and he died on the cross, okay. So he believed in the morality. Yeah, he absolutely did, yeah, he did. Um, and Nietzsche basically was making a historical statement about God is dead. He said, and he was right. He was basically saying that in this, in the century in which he lived, um, And he died, I think, in 1900. Again, I could be wrong about that. So I just want to say that I believe he died in 1900. Okay, so so he's writing in the 1800s. And he's basically saying, um, God is dead and we killed him. Okay, so he's making a historical statement that at that point in time, with science just kind of getting better and industrialization happening, um, the idea of um, this, this... thing beyond what we know as material reality is dead. So this the substrate of Western civilization is dead. That's what Nietzsche, Nietzsche is saying, mm. if that makes sense. Yes. And well, he basically says, with that comes the Ubermensch, okay, which is the superhuman. And he says, there aren't many of them. He says, but they're going to come. And he also talks about the philosophers of the future. And he's speaking and writing to them is my belief. So he's basically telling you and Mm -hmm. me, because we're now the philosophers of his future. Yeah. Yeah. He's basically telling us, this is what's happening now. And look what it has done. He says, now everything is is possible, all manner of, of terrible evil, because no one has the belief in God anymore. The belief that there's uh, that there is an afterlife. You asked about an afterlife. So with this kind of belief in a, a morality comes this belief, you know, you can have morals without God. Okay, people do. But what Christianity is this idea that you will reap what you sow. So if people don't believe that anymore, what will happen? And so that's what he's basically saying is that the the basic anchor for Western society is now gone. Do you think he was right? Absolutely. Absolutely right. But then again, what do you think if we brought him back to life and he read American Cosmic, your book, um, and he wrote, he tweeted about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> writing a review maybe for the, I don't know what they post, for New York Times, he'd be an ed- editorial writer uh, with a blue check mark on Twitter. Uh, what, what do you think he would say about this idea that you present that's a grander idea of religion? And, you know. Like religiosity, like religiosity. this new form. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't that kind of reverse the idea that God is dead? Yeah because it would bring up this idea of external intelligences that are not human, which is basically a lot of religions talk about that, right? There are bodhisattvas, there are angels, there are demons, you know, there are all these types of non-human intelligences that religion makes space for. So what I'm basically saying in American Cosmic is these new things are within the realm of UFOs and UAPs. So would no, I think that well, I think Nietzsche would say that that's a progressive adaptation of religion is what I would hope he would say. Nietzsche however is unpredictable, I think. I I couldn't predict him. So I would say that it would be my hope that he would say this is an accurate representation of a move into a new type of religion. And it's adaptive, therefore progressive. He would probably be uncomfortable reading a book by a brilliant fe- uh, female professor. Who happens oh. also to be short. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you you read that. No. By, yeah, uh, oh, he's, <laughs> he said some pretty nasty things about short women. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Nietzsche, he should be canceled. <laughs> no, no, please don't cancel Nietzsche. You have to take people in the context of their time. Although I'm pretty sure in his time he was also an asshole. He but, was. <laughs> <laughs> but assholes are people too. Okay. Just bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> 
Einstein famously said that God doesn't play dice. Yeah. You have studied the world through the eyes of statistics. So let me ask you in terms of the nature of reality, fundamental nature of reality. Does God play dice? You don't know some factors. And because you don't know some factors, which could be important, it looks like God play dice. But we don't we should describe it. In philosophy they distinguish between two positions, positions of instrumentalism, where you're creating theory for prediction and position of realism, where you're trying to understand what God did. Yeah. So in two thousand one you gave a series of lectures at MIT about religion and science. No, that was nineteen ninety nine. But 19, you published uh, sorry, the, book, the book came out in 2001. In 2000. So in 1999, you spent a little bit of time in Boston enough to give uh, those lectures. Yeah. And uh, I read in the 2001 version, uh, the, most of it. It's quite fascinating read. I recommend people, uh, it's a transcription of your lectures. So what did you learn about how ideas get started and grow from studying the history of the Bible? So you've rigorously stu studied a very particular part of the Bible. Uh, what did you learn from this process about the way us human beings as a society uh, develop well, and grow ideas, share ideas, and yeah, are defined by those ideas? Well, I, it's hard to summarize that. Um, I wouldn't say that I that I learned a great deal of, of really definite things like where, I, where I could make conclusions, but I learned more about what I don't know. You have a complex subject which is really beyond human understanding, uh, uh, so, so we give up on saying, I'm ever gonna get to the end of the road and I'm ever gonna understand it, but you say, but, but maybe it might be good for me to, uh, uh, to get closer and closer and learn more about, more and more about something, and so, you know, how, how can I do that uh, uh, efficiently? And the answer uh, is, well, use randomness. Um, and so, tr tr so try a random subset of the uh, that that is within my grasp, and 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 study that in detail instead of just uh, studying parts that somebody tells me to study, or instead of st studying nothing. Because it's too hard, um, uh, so I, I, I decided uh, uh, for for my own amusement at one, once that I would, I would take a subset of the of the uh, verses of the Bible, and I would um, try to find out what the best thinkers have said about the, the, that small subset. And I had, I had about, let's say, six, 60 verses out of out of 3,000. I think it's one out of 500 or something like this. And so then I went to the libraries, which which are well indexed. Uh, uh, you can you you. I, I spent, uh, at, for example, at uh, at Boston Public Library. I I would go once a week for for a year, and I went to I went to half a dozen times to. And over Harvard Library to to look at this you know, books that weren't in the Boston public, uh, where they where scholars had looked and you can go and they and you can go down the shelves and you and and you can pretty and you can look in the index and say oh is there is this verse mentioned anywhere in this book if so look at page one hundred and five so so mm -hmm. in other words I I could learn not only about the Bible but about the secondary literature about the Bible the things that scholars have written about it and so that. That gave me a way to uh, 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 to zoom in on parts of the thing so that I could get more more insight, and 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 so I look at it as as a way of giving me some some firm pegs of which I in which I could hang pieces of information, but not as as things where I would say, and therefore this is true. In this uh, random approach of sampling the Bible, yeah. what did you? learn about the the most uh you know central uh, it, it one of the biggest that, accumulation it, of ideas in it, our it seemed to me that the, the that the main thrust was not the one that most people think of as saying you know oh, oh, oh you know don't have sex or something like this <laughs> um but that the main thrust was uh to try to 
to, to try to figure out how to live in harmony with God's wishes. Hmm. I'm assuming that God exists, and I, as I say, I'm glad that I that it, there's no way to prove this because that wouldn't that would I, I would run through the proof once and then I'd forget it, and and it would and and I would never uh, uh, speculate about spiritual things and, and mysteries. Otherwise, and I think my life would be very incomplete. So I'm, uh, so, so I'm, I'm assuming that God exists. But it, if, uh, but a lot of the, the people say God doesn't exist, but that's still important to them. And so, in a, in, a, in a way, that might st still be whether God is there or not. Uh, uh, in some sense, uh, it, it, uh, it, God is important to them. It's, it's one of the one of the verses I studied. I, is, you can interpret it as saying, uh, you know, it's much better to be an atheist th than not to care at all. So, mm. uh, <laughs> so I would say it's, yeah, it's similar to the P equals NP discussion. Uh, yeah. You you mentioned a mental exercise uh, that I, I, I'd love it if you could partake in yourself, a uh, mental exercise of uh, being God. And so how would you, if you were God, Don Knuth, how would you present yourself to the people of Earth? You mentioned uh, your love of literature, and there was uh, there's this book that that really uh, I can recommend to you. If I, I think, yeah, the title I think is Blasphemy. It talks about uh, God revealing Himself at, through a computer in in, okay. in 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 Los Alamos, and and uh, it um, uh, it's the only book that I've ever read where uh, the punchline was really the very last word of the book. And it and explained the whole idea of the book, and so I don't want to give that away. But it, but it's really very much about this question that you that that you raised. Uh, uh, the, uh, but but so suppose God uh, uh, said, "Okay, that my my, pre my previous um, means of communication with the world are not the best for the twenty first century. So what should I do now?" And uh, and and it's conceivable that that it would uh, that that God would choose the way that's described in this book. Another way to look at this exercise is uh, looking at the human mind, looking at the human spirit, the human life in a systematic way. I think it mostly you want to learn humility. You want to realize that once we solve one problem, that doesn't mean that we're that all of a sudden other, mm. other problems are going to drop out. And 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 we have to realize that that uh, uh, that there are there are things beyond our beyond our our ability. Um, I see hubris all around. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, well said. Uh, when you go up to heaven and meet God and get to ask one question that would get answered, uh, what question would you ask? What kind of browser do you have up here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I actually, I, I, I don't think it's meaningful to ask this question, okay. but... But uh, I, I certainly hope we had good internet. <laughs> okay, on that note, uh, that's that's a that's beautiful, actually. Um, Don, thank you so much. It was a huge honor to talk to you. I really okay. appreciate well, it. Well, thanks for the gamut of questions. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Donald Knuth. And thank you to our presenting sponsor, Cash App. Download it. Use code Lex Podcast. You'll get ten dollars, and ten dollars will go to first a STEM education nonprofit that inspires hundreds of thousands of young minds to learn and to dream of engineering our future. If you enjoy this podcast, subscribe on YouTube, give it five stars on Apple Podcasts, support it on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter. And now, let me leave you with some words of wisdom from Donald Knuth. We should continually be striving to transform every art into a science. And in the process, we advance the art. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. What do you think Nietzsche meant when he said that God is dead? So there's a sense that religion is fading from society. And uh, there's a 
cranky German that kind of wrote about it. <laughs> a, what do you think he meant? He was a cranky German who knew a lot about Dionysus, by the way. <laughs> yeah, um, he did. Which is why I like him. Uh, so certainly there's some truth to the mortality of God. Um, I think Gallup put out a study only a couple months ago where church membership is now officially in the minority in the United States at 47%, according to the mo most recent poll. That number was closer to 70% only 20 years ago. Wow. So we're living through something. And we're living through the unchurching of America. And it's the rise of the spiritual but not religious, um, you know, the, uh, the inheritor of all traditions but the slave to none. There's a, a rise in the unaffiliated, the nuns. I think it was like one third of millennials. It's probably much higher now that don't affiliate with any religion. So in that sense, God is absolutely dead. Um, but maybe not the God that we were trying to define at the very beginning. You know, so Nietzsche also looked forward to the Ubermensch, which would be a fully realized human being that despite the death of God, um, did not fall into nihilism and amorality, existential despair, all that great German stuff. Um, and there are some commentators who talk about this eternal recurrence that just maybe by incorporating some of these techniques, not necessarily doctrine and dogma, but I would say the techniques of antiquity. Um, and again, Nietzsche writes a lot about the rationality of Dionysus having its place in society. If, if anything, these biochemical discoveries, I think, point us back. They point us back to Dionysus mm -hmm. and the responsible incorporation of the irrational into our otherwise society of, of rational um, people and our kazooistry. I, I have a sense that there will be kind of, just kind of as you've implied, that there will be uh, maybe the God of old is dying and there'll be a rebirth of different kind of God and it'll just keep happening throughout history. I, I do think there will be a time where AI will be the gods we'll look to, uh, the, the other, the, the super intelligent, those kinds of things. Who or what do you think God is? How is our conception, maybe put another way, of God changed throughout history? We're starting with an easy one, Lex. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so what is God? Well, God is a thought. God is an idea. But its, its reference is to that which is beyond thinking, beyond our ability to even conceive, um, beyond the categories of being and non-being. So how do we talk about that? To talk about it is almost to get it wrong, mm -hmm. right? So uh, Joe Campbell famously said that, you know, any God that is not transparent to transcendence is like an idolatry because it's just a mental construct and it can't possibly speak to the incomprehensible. So we use poetic language. We say the being of beings, the, um, the infinite life energy of the universe, the, the mystery of transcendence, boundless life, unqualified isness. But it doesn't quite get to the point. I think that if there's any great insight from mysticism, it's that you and I participate with God in a very real way, Lex Friedman, here in Austin, Texas, that in the here and now to touch that eternal principle, another way to refer to God, to touch that eternal principle within ourselves is to participate with, with divinity in some way. Um, so not an external force, but that divine sense within. So there's some aspect in which God is a part of us. So one, it's a thing we can't describe. It represents all of the mystery around us. It's outside our ability to comprehend. And at the same time, it's somehow the thing that's inside of us also. The ultimate paradox. Me Mechthild of Magdeburg, 13th century German mystic, maybe the first German mystic, um, says that the, the day of her spiritual awakening was the day that she saw and knew that she saw God in all things and all things in God. And so we can say this, by the way, without apology or lightweight theology or vapid speculation or even heresy. You know, we can, we can talk about this, including within the Abrahamic faiths. The mystical core of these faiths all talk about the encounter of divinity within. That's what I explore in the immortality key, the, the, this notion of uh, techniques archaic techniques in some cases of ecstasy that allow that experience of the eternal principle to actually rise up in our consciousness when we're still here as flesh and blood beings. There's some sense in which our conception of God, though, 
is conjured up by our own mind. And so aren't we creating God? Like, aren't we the gods that are creating the idea of God? Like if, if we are, like when we talk about God, aren't we playing with ideas that are created by our, our mind and thereby we are the creator, not God? <laughs> this is a very kind of cyclical question, but in, in some sense, I mean that uh, if God is the thing that represents the mystery all around us, contrast that with our conception of God, the way we talk about him, is more a creation of our minds. It's not the mystery. It's our uh, struggle to comprehend the mystery. And therefore, we're creating the God in terms of the God that we we're talking about in this conversation or in general, if that makes any sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> Great. This is wonderful. <laughs> but this is, this, is, uh, this is the eternal mystery. Um, this is why it's so difficult to talk about, and yet it could be the very center of our beings. Um, you know, the Upanishads speak about us as the creators, about us as gods. It's a very different creation myth, but the god of the Upanishads um, in this great verse talks about um, pouring themselves, pouring themselves into creation. Um, Indeed, I have become this creation, says God. And there's a great line, uh, verily he or she who knows this becomes in this creation a creator. So yeah, I mean, just our ability to engage in mentation, our ability to to think about this stuff is partly our divine nature. This is what the humanists were talking about in, in the Renaissance, by the way. Um, and that it's not so much learning, putting dots together, having arguments with each other over learned books. It's It's a process of unlearning is what some of the mystical traditions talk about unlearning all these thoughts, emotions, traumas, and experiences that have gone into the false construction of our false self, that behind all these layers, like peeling back the onion, is a part of us that, once you can identify that, um, begins to look a little bit different. In other words, it's one thing to foster a relationship with God. It's a very different thing to identify as God. And I, and I mean that quite literally, without being heretical. You can you can find this in the mystery traditions. Can you expand on this? You mean a human being can can embody God? That is um, textbook incarnational theology that you can find in any any Christian mystic. Um, but you can find it in the mystical tradition of Islam and and Judaism as well. So Rumi, for example. Um, the great, uh, the great Sufi mystic talks about um, if you could get rid of yourself, just get rid of yourself just once. The secret of secrets would open to you. That the face of the unknown mm. would appear on the perception of your consciousness. Uh, um, Rabbi Lawrence Kushner, a modern day contemporary mystic, mm -hmm. talks about uh, because this stuff does continue. There's a continuity to the it. The poetry here is incredible. So, well, listen, listen to Rabbi Kushner. Uh, he says that the, the emptying of selfhood allows the soul to attach to true reality. And in Kabbalism, the true reality is what's called the divine nothingness, ayin. And so I like the adage that um, atheists and mystics both essentially believe in nothing, except that the mystics spell it with a capital N, the divine nothing. Yeah. And then I'll give you Meister Eckhart, um, uh, another medieval Christian mystic, he says that um, if you could knot yourself, right? The same concept. If you could knot yourself for just an instant, indeed, I say less than an instant, you would possess all. So again, you're seeing the same thing in Sufism, Kabbalism, Christian mysticism. The way to identify with the divine is to peel back these layers and attempt to discover pure awareness. If we look at the universe from a physics perspective, or, you know, I'm, I'm a computer science person, so if the universe is a is a computer there's some sense that god the creator of the universe or just the computer itself doesn't know what the heck is going to happen he just kind of creates some basic rules and runs the thing so there is some element in which you can conceive of humans or conscious beings or intelligent beings as uh as a tool 
that the creator uses to understand itself himself do, do you uh do you think that's a perspective that uh we could or is useful to take on god that um uh, is basically the universe created humans to understand itself he doesn't actually know the full thing. He, <laughs> he needs the human brains to figure out the puzzle. So that's in contrasting to the unlearning, to the getting mm. out of the way that we've talked about. It's more like, no, we need the humans to figure out this puzzle. Well, we have no answers to this, which is why philosophers still have jobs, if they have jobs at all. But I mean, there. Are, you know, so the physicists take a look at this. Um, have you seen the article that came out, I think it was this month, in the Journal of Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, um, uh, Robert Lanza, the biocentrism theory, the idea that the universe comes into being through our observation, right? The whole, yeah. the God equation. So not just in quantum mechanics, but in general relativity, the idea that that we make the universe moment by moment, which is kind of mind-blowing, gets into ideas of simulation, Okay, so that's how the physicists, at least some of them, might look at it. You could also look back to the medieval Christian mystics. Meister Eckhart, once again, says that the eye with which I see God is the same eye that sees me, right? So one sight, one knowledge, one love. Um, another mind-blowing concept. But this is, this is why the arts and poetry and music are so important, because although I love astroparticle physics— it's another to kind of hear this, uh, the, the same message um, across time. Yeah, the simulation thing, <laughs> I was uh, actually looking this morning at uh, video games, just the statistics on video games, and I saw that uh, the two top video games in terms of hours played is Fortnite and World of Warcraft, and I saw that it's 140 billion hours, billion hours have been played at those games. Um, <laughs> That's a lot of video games. That's, well, yeah, but that that's very sophisticated worlds being created, especially in the world of Warcraft. It's a massive online role-playing game. So you have these characters that are together sort of creating a world, but they in themselves are also developing. They have all these items and they're grow like they're little humans. Like there's complicated societies that are formed, they have goals, they're striving and so on. And it's, we're creating a universe within our universe. And for now it's a kind of, um, it's a basic sort of constraint version of our more richer earth-like civilization. But it's conceivable that, you know, that we are, this thing on earth is a kind of video game that somebody else is playing. It's like it, you could see sort of video games upon video games being created that, uh, and th th this is something I think a lot about, not from a philosophical perspective, but practically, how fun does this video game have to be for us to let go of the silly pursuits in this meat space that we live in and fully just stay in WoW, stay in World of Warcraft, stay in the video game for full time. So I think about that from an engineering perspective. Mm. Like, is there going to be a time when this video game is actual real life for us? And then the creatures inside the video game, they'll be just borrowing our consciousness sort of to ground themselves will refer to us as the gods right like won't we become the gods <laughs> it's, this conversation is not going how i expected <laughs> but I, I think about this a lot from you know because i love video games and i wonder more and more of us especially in COVID times are living in the digital world you could think about twitter and all those kinds of things you could do, think about clubhouse people using just voices to communicate with little icons sort of in the digital space, you could see more and more will be moving in the digital space and let go of this physical space. And then the the remnants of the, the ancients that created the video games that nobody centuries from now will even remember, those will be the gods. And then there'll be gods upon gods being created. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff I think about. But is, is that any at all useful to you to this thought experiment of a simulation, basically, the fabric of our reality, how did it come to be? What is running this thing? Is that useful? Or is it ultimately the project of understanding God, of understanding myth, is a project that centers on the human, on the human mind for you? Hmm. We seem to be at the center of this divine dance, which, which sounds awfully anthropocentric, but um, the ancients thought about this too. I mean, the concept in Sanskrit of Leela, 
that the point behind existence is this play, right? It, it's ultimately playful, this divine dance. It gets awfully complicated in the Gnostic and Neoplatonic schools, these um, chains of being from Godhead down to us, right? Mm -hmm. um, some invisible, right? And we're going to get into Terence McKenna territory later on, but we can start now by talking about discarnate entities and archons and aliens and archetypes. I mean, there is a, a world where Terence McKenna does meet Plato and Gnosticism um, quite kindly, and that, that's in the, um, this invisible college, right? The, um, the invisible world uh, with which we seem to have some kind of symbiosis um, that has a higher intent maybe even a purpose or a plan in mind for us. So, I mean, the, these ideas come across when you've had a heroic dose of mushrooms. Um, they also pop up in the ancient philosophical literature, this idea of archons who, you know, the, the puppet masters con controlling us flesh and blood beings. Um, it's, all a, it's all a cosmic dance, and there are no answers to this. First, who are the archons? And second, what is this world where Terence McKenna means Plato? Do you mean in the space of ideas? Or are we talking about some kind of world that connects all of consciousness to all of human history? I think through different techniques, it is, you know, I think a lot about, I think Gordon Wasson is the meeting point of the two. So, so Gordon Wasson, who I do talk about in the book, uh, was this um, J.P. Morgan banker turned ethnomycologist. And he's largely credited with the rediscovery of psilocybin containing mushrooms, which kind of gave rise to the pop psychedelic revolution of the 1960s. Um, he visited Maria Sabina down in Mexico. In his wake went Bob Dylan, Led Zeppelin, The Stones, and everybody else. Um, and the way he describes his psilocybin experience um, is a bit strange because he thinks of Plato, right? Um, and he says that, you know, whereas our ordinary reality is kind of this imperfect view of things, uh, Gordon Wasson felt that on mushrooms, he was spying the archetypes. And he talks about Plato, and he writes about the archetypes in this famous article that's released in 1957 in Life magazine. And so a well-read individual from the mid-20th century has his premier psychedelic experience, and out comes Plato, because what he was witnessing was so sharp, so brilliant, so detailed, in some sense, more real than real, this noetic sense that William James talks about that when you confront something more real than real, these discarnate entities, these images, this, uh, these visionary motifs, you're tempted to believe that you've tapped into the truest nature and the underlying structure of the cosmos. And that's difficult to escape from, whether you're Plato or Terence McKenna or Gordon Wasson caught in between. You have footprints in all of the sciences. So let's talk about the universe a little bit. Is the universe at the lowest level deterministic or stochastic in your amateur philosophy view? Put another way, does God play dice? Well, we know it is stochastic, right? Because today, today we think it is stochastic. Yes. We think because we have the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and we have some experiments to um, confirm that. All we have is experiments to confirm it. We don't understand why. Why is already... You wrote a book about yes. why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a puzzle. It's a puzzle that you have the a dice uh, flipping machine, or God, and the, and the uh, result of the flipping propagate with a speed faster than the speed of light. Right. We can't explain that, okay? So, um, but it, it only governs microscopic phenomena. So you don't think of quantum mechanics as useful no. uh, for it's understanding the nature of reality? No, it's diversionary. So in your thinking, the world might as well be deterministic. The world is deterministic, and as far as the new one firing is concerned, it's it deterministic to first approximation. Let's start with a big question. According to Judaism, who is God? It's difficult because Judaism, like any tradition that is thousands of years old and encompasses so many different lands and languages and thinkers, um, it doesn't give a single answer to even simple questions. And to large questions, it certainly doesn't give a single answer. Although Judaism was responsible for introducing the monotheistic idea to the world, it doesn't mean that it's one idea. So if you take Maimonides, the greatest sage 
in the Jewish tradition, um, medieval philosopher, he would say that God is an omnipotent, benevolent, intangible, unimaginable God. In fact, he said you can't say what God is, only what God is not, because you have to emphasize, could talk more about that, but basically you have to emphasize the unknowability of God. You have a modern philosopher like Heschel, who says that God is a God of pathos, a God of deep feeling, which probably would make Maimonides shiver if he heard such a description. And if you look in the Bible, God is always regretting or having human emotions. So there are so many different kinds of depictions and ideas, and there is this tremendous tension between transcendence and imminence. That is, in the Jewish tradition, God, God is exquisitely close. God is imminent. In the Talmud's words, God is as close as your mouth is to your ear. Um, in other words, whatever you say, God hears it. And yet at the same time, God is unfathomably distant. Sometimes when I speak to high schoolers, I will say in the Jewish tradition, think of it this way. When you were two years old, you had no idea what it was to be a 15-year-old. Not only did you not know, but you didn't know what you didn't know. We conceive of God as being more, the distance between God and human beings is far greater than the distance between a two-year-old and a 15-year-old. So when we speak about God, we have to acknowledge how limited we really are. So, okay, you laid out a lot of fascinating things on the table. So one, the knowability of God, then this idea of deep feeling, which again, can, can God be operate in the space of feelings too. So not just the mouth and the ear of the senses. Can uh, God be known? Can God be felt by this three-year-old in the analogy uh, versus the, the teenager? So I will take refuge in a beautiful phrase by from Martin Buber, another Jewish theologian. He said, God cannot be expressed. God can only be addressed. In other words, you can speak to God you can feel a sense of God, but can you begin to comprehend or know God? No. Yosef Kaspi, I'm pulling in a couple of uh, early Jewish philosophers. He said, to know God, I would have to be God. But can we get close? Is it useful or is it a distraction to visualize things, to embody, to create, to, the, uh, to attach to the stories some kind of visualizations in our mind? Uh, for example, gender, he versus she, right, right. things like this, or old man in the sky kind of feeling. So it's almost inevitable, but I think ultimately you try to transcend it. Um, this was uh, this was the great, you know, we just read this actually in synagogue, the story of the golden calf. And the uh, the story is that human beings found it impossible to not have a visualization because they had just come from Egypt and in, pa in the world of, of uh, pagan worship, everything is, it's not that pagans thought that idol was actually God, but it represented visually what God was. And along comes this idea that God is actually not capable of being visualized, which is very difficult and it stretches the bounds of human comprehension, maybe even breaks them. So would you say the, the proper way to operate as a human in relation to God is um, humility in that you're screwed. You're not able to basically know anything, almost anything. Well, the reason that you're, the salvation of this is <laughs> that you can't, <laughs> that you can't, I was going to say the reason you're not screwed, but then I thought somebody might be upset at a yeah. rabbi saying that. So I'm, so I didn't say it and have not said it. Yes. Um, but, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the reason you're not is, that you don't have to have a comprehension of God. You have to have a relationship to God. And those are not the same. I mean, to draw an, a, 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 an analogy that is not far from perfect, as most analogies are, but this one especially, you have relationships with people who are mysteries to you. You're, mysteries to, you're a mystery to yourself. Um, you can live and love somebody for 50 years and they can say something that surprises you because ultimately we are trapped in here. And when a child first says, I, we call that individuation. But what that really means is I, I now know that I am cut off from the minds of all other children and all other people. And 
So you have with God a more intimate relationship because you can believe that God is, you are known by God and you have a relationship to God despite the fact that you can't know God just as you can't know others. And some would say to have a good relationship, you want to be constantly surprised. Right. <laughs> you yes. don't want to know well, the thing. Well, the full. world, yes, the world that God created is constantly surprising. But and by the way, the 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 caveat to this, you know, when I I, used, I had all these debates with Christopher Hitchens, and he would always say that God is a greater tyrant than North Korea because it continues after your death. And the idea of being known by God is, after all, frightening if you think God knows what I think and so on. Um, if your image of God is unloving, proposed a lot of interesting out of the box ideas. A meta learning adversarial networks, but what do you think is the mind of Einstein's God? Do you think there's a why that we could untangle from this from this uh, universe of strings? Why are we here? What is the meaning of it all? Well, Steven Weinberg, winner of the Nobel Prize, once said that the more we learn about the universe, the more we learn that it's pointless. <laughs> well. <laughs> I don't know. I don't yeah. profess to understand the great secrets of the universe. However, let me say two things about what the giants of physics have said about this question. Einstein believed in two types of God. One was the God of the Bible, the personal God, the God that answers prayers, walks on waters, performs miracles, smites the Philistines. Mm -hmm. That's the personal God that he didn't believe in. He believed in the God of Spinoza, the God of order, simplicity, harmony, beauty. The universe could have been ugly. The universe could have been messy, random, but it's gorgeous. You realize that on a single sheet of paper, we can write down all the known laws of the universe. It's amazing. On one sheet of paper, Einstein's equation is one inch long. String theory is a lot longer and so is the standard model. But you could put all these equations on one sheet of paper. It didn't have to be that way. It could have been messy. And so Einstein thought of himself as a young boy entering this huge library for the first time, yeah. being overwhelmed by the simplicity, elegance, and beauty of this library. But all he could do was read the first page of the first volume. Well, that library is the universe with all sorts of mysterious, magical things that we have yet to find. And then Galileo was asked about this. Galileo said that the purpose of science, the purpose of science is to determine how the heavens go. The purpose of religion is to determine how to go to heaven. So in other words, science is about natural law. And religion is about ethics, how to be a good person, how to go to heaven. As long as we keep these two things apart, we're in great shape. The problem occurs when people from the natural sciences begin to pontificate about ethics and people from religion begin to pontificate about natural law. That's where we get into big trouble. You think they're fundamentally distinct, morality and ethics and our our idea of what is right and what is wrong, that's something that's outside the reach of string theory and physics. That's right. If you talk to a squirrel about <laughs> what is right and what is wrong, yes, there, there's no reference frame for a squirrel. And realize that aliens from outer space, if they ever come visit us, they'll try to talk to us like we talk to squirrels in the forest, but eventually we get bored talking to the squirrels because they don't talk back to us. Same thing with aliens from outer space. When they come down to Earth, they'll be curious about us to a degree. But after a while, they just get bored because we have nothing to offer them. So our sense of right and wrong, what does that mean compared to a squirrel's sense of mm. right and wrong? Now, we, of course, do have an ethics that keeps civilizations in line, enriches our life, and make civilization possible. And I think that's a good thing, but it's not mandated by a law of physics. 